And today we're going to be addressing how faith works when we speak. Okay, how faith works when we speak our mind. Okay, how it should work and how it shouldn't work. I mean, and how it doesn't work when we speak our mind. Okay, so first off, the topic of the tongue has already been addressed um, in chapter two. If we are what, biased, if we are partial, we're going to act and do and say things that are not of God, and we will have, uh, and then even if we say we have faith, it's proved by our, our works, okay, that we don't really abide in Christ. James 2, 26 says this, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Okay, this is the verse right before today's text. Okay, we, so we, we saw this last week. But then James transitions as, as we now go into chapter 3. And he wants to focus on the tongue specifically, which makes this next verse even more perplexing. Okay, because he talks about a teacher. He says this, chapter 3, verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Greater strictness. In other words, don't take this role lightly. Don't go, don't go after it just because it's a position of prestige, so to speak. Okay? After all, and when you teach, it does involve words. And James isn't simply talking about being any teacher. He's talking about being in the church. But I would say that it still applies in the greater teacher role and setting. Okay? Because it's an, it's an important role. If you think about whether at any school setting, right, elementary school, right, you, you're engaging with that teacher. That teacher is impressing upon those kids in the classroom ways to think, ways to act. Right? So it's an important role. And sometimes teachers, if you think about it, spend more time with kids there than the parents actually do during the week, or almost the same amount. But once you add like weekends, where there's all these other extracurricular activities, um, sports or lessons and art or music, sometimes the kids don't even have that much time with their parents. So, and also, James is not saying we should not desire to be teachers, but we understand the role, the responsibility, the effect we have on those around us who are going to be those students, whether they are five, six, seven, eight years old, or whether they are adults, but still we are teaching others. And if you're not teaching our children or others what is good, okay, then, um, well, sorry, then how do we know that the world is not teaching what, are, what, what is good? Public schools are part of our government, private schools are run by men and women, and the world and the morality that our world holds can sometimes not be fully aligned with scripture and with what Jesus wants us to do, okay? So, but at the same time, don't do the opposite of what I've seen many people do when they reference this verse. They said, oh, I'll be judged with greater strictness, so I just don't want to be a teacher. Okay, I'm going to be, okay, because I will be, I will avoid being a teacher at all costs, because that way, I won't be judged with greater strictness. I can be judged with more leniency. Like, no, if we know what is right to do, let us do that so that we can help others also follow the right way. Okay, and also know this, James, when he's speaking again, is he speaking to the person you probably want to call, someone who's wealthy, someone who's famous, someone who is all these nice, great things. They're, they're, the, they're the upper echelon, they're top number one of the one of the athletes. Is that who James is talking to? No, he's talking to the people who are poor. Mochi, right? Okay, that's who he's talking to. People who are poor, people who are persecuted, people who are oppressed. Okay, and this is 2,000 years ago. Okay, everything back then is very backwards, almost. Almost everything. Backwards from what we are used to today. There's no such thing as electricity and lights. I just lost power this week. And then it's just like, huh. It's just a reminder of how even electricity is a modern technology. And then it, it was funny because I saw my son do it. He walked in the bathroom, flipped the light. Oh, oh, yeah. Like, hey, daddy did that a lot of times too. Where you're like, ah, oh. <laughs> right? Yeah. Who hasn't done that? And you remember, oh, yes, we are in the modern world. Back then, 2,000 years ago, I mean, even 100 years ago, not everybody had electricity, right? The, 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 the smartphones that we have, okay? The, just 10 years ago, there was barely even a smartphone. We still had dumb phones 10 years ago, pretty much. Okay, so things have changed. People back then, if you were poor, there's no public school. Think about that. If it was like a hundred years ago, we would barely even know how to read and write. We could talk, 
But we would be like, oh, what's your, what's your name? I know my name. How do you write it? Well, I don't know. Right? So think about it. J James is speaking to people who don't even know how to read. So that's why he's asking, like, or he's telling them, if you want to teach, understand the responsibility there is. Because you can't even read the Bible. You have to wait till whenever there is a worship service and then someone who can read reads the text to you. And then you can do your best, like, okay, memorize whatever the, the reader, the, the person who's reading the, 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 the Bible is saying. Okay? You would have needed someone to read Scripture, okay? That is why Paul is asking, are you even going to be able to teach well? Be careful of what your heart wants, because you may want to be a teacher, but you might not be ready. That said, I do want to take a moment to thank everyone who is or was a teacher. Okay, if you were, okay, pat yourself on the back. Okay, if you're still a Sunday school teacher or if you're an academic teacher or whatever, or if you're a parent, you're still a teacher, right? Okay, so then like, just press on, Gayo, okay, because it is a difficult uh, job, a difficult responsibility. Now, James is directly addressing teachers in the church, okay? So that's what I'm going to address mostly, but understand indirectly still, we, we can, it has still of the being a teacher or what he's teaching can also still apply indirectly to people who are teachers outside of the church, okay? Because just as in the church there are ramifications outside the church, there are still ramifications for what you do as a teacher, okay? You still will be judged with greater strictness. But we are in the church, and we're literally in the church right now. So when we speak our mind, here's my first point. Okay, when we speak our mind, faith works when we are in control of our body, okay? That's when we see faith working, when we're in control of our body. The next verse says this, For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man or woman, able also to bridle his whole body. Okay? This is true. We still make mistakes, right? Even though we are believers, even though we're Christians, do we make mistakes? Yes. Okay, we forget to grab something at the grocery store because we didn't write it down, right? Or maybe we forgot to bring our list, right? That happens too, like, oh, where's my list? Ah, oh, it's on the dining table, right? We don't, we don't notice that someone went out of, out of their way to help us, and we forget to say thank you. We're tired, and instead of saying something gentle, we say something curt and snippy, right? We don't intentionally do that. Hopefully, we don't have Christians. Okay, we don't purposely fall down. Who does that, right? I don't think anyone chooses to fall down. Little kids do. They like to fall down. But like as, as adults, right? Because I, 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 I'm scolding myself. I'm like, stop falling down on the ground for no reason. But as adults, I don't think any of us want to fall down, right? It hurts. We're, we're not little anymore. Okay? So do you understand? James's point is saying he somehow, some are able to be perfect because they are able to bridle their whole body. But what does it mean to bridle? You guys remember? Okay, I brought up a picture a few weeks ago. I'm going to show you the same picture again in a second, okay? But the idea is the body is bridled. And then James says this, verse 3, if we put bits in our mouths of horses so that, oh sorry, <laughs> I don't know. If we put bits in the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Okay, and this is 100% true. I did go to Minnesota during the summer. I saw how um, the reins are attached to the bridle, which control the horse, okay? And so James is giving us a visual idea of what, control, how, how the horse gets control, okay? So if you see this, okay, same picture, all right? Not doing any little, little, little uh, shifty things. But notice that everything is leather except for what? Do you see a little metal piece next to the horse's, like, jaw? And inside, and that's attached to a bar, okay, that goes between the teeth. That's made out of metal, it's not leather. And the reason why is because it was leather, I mean the horse would probably bite through it in like a week or something, chew through it. But you want it to be soft around the face, but you need to make sure that that piece that's in the mouth next to the tongue is metal so that it stays there. Because think about it, if you were to pull on the reins, like if you're sitting on the horse and you're pulling on the reins, what's gonna happen if that piece isn't there? That, you're gonna do that to the horse. It's going to be painful. The horse is not going to like it. So it needs something here to make sure that the whole part that's attached to the head stays in the right place. But you need something metal, otherwise the horse will break it or, or, or bite through it. Okay. But once all everything is in place, now when you pull on the reins, you pull left, the horse goes left. You have to train it, of course, and then pull right, goes right. You pull back, the horse stops. You let it go or you kind of whip it a little bit gently, right? Then it knows, oh, okay, time to go a little bit faster. 
Okay, so that's how it works. But think about it. That part is all the head. That little bit is really, really important. And that controls the whole horse. Okay, that little piece of metal. So then James says this. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member. Okay, he's talking about ships of his day, 2,000 years ago. Okay, they're made out of mostly wood, maybe a little metal. Okay, but even, but even in today's world, 2,000 years later, same thing. If we imagine a U.S. aircraft carrier, anyone know what the largest one is now? It's okay, I'll, now you'll know. Okay, it's the USS Gerald R. Ford. It weighs over 100,000 tons. Nearly 1,100 feet in length, 78 meters wide, has two runways. Okay, well, let me go to the next picture. Okay, two runways. Has two nuclear-powered, 350,000 horsepower engines. Okay, that's over half a million horsepower. All right, complemented by 4,660 men and women, carries 75 aircraft. Obviously, there's not 75 on there right now, but it can. Okay, and it probably does, but it's just this is a different picture that they're trying to show us. But with all that weight, all that personnel, all that hardware, I didn't even tell you all the, all the weapons and all the bombs that it has, okay? But it's steered by a rudder that's just one-tenth of one percent of the ship's size. Something so big, so massive, 100,000 tons, and something that's one-thousandth of its weight is what controls the direction of the ship. The tongue is like the rudder of a ship. It controls the whole body. Actually, I did a little research. It was a little hard to find because when you look up what are the dimensions of a tongue, I was trying to find the weight. They're always like, it's this long. It's like, I don't care about how long it is. I'm trying to find the weight. And so the weight is zero. Well, anybody have a guess? Is your tongue about a pound? No. Who, I mean, who asked this question? No. Right? Me. Okay. But anyway, so I looked it up. It's point zero. Sorry. 0 0.16 to 0.17 pounds. It's a seventh of a pound, okay? Basically, it's also about one one thousandth of our body weight. Okay, if, if we're about 150 pounds, it's about one one thousand. Pretty astonishing if you think about it, okay? And that, and, and James is saying, just like even the rudder on the ship, our tongue is super tiny. The mass that it is compared to our body is one one thousand, but it controls our body. It controls our life for better or for worse. We can say it's for the better. Hopefully we do. But James doesn't ask us if we want the good news or bad news. He's going to give us both of them. And he gives us the bad news first, okay? But here's my second point, which is about the bad news. Wait, well, so when we stick our mind, faith works when we see how powerful our tongue is. How powerful our tongue is. In verses 5 and 6, James continues. He says, So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts great things, of great things. How great is a forest? Sorry, how great a forest is. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on Fire by hell. So I got a few, point, few points here that didn't fit in your handout, but if you want to write in the margins, you can. First sub-point is the tongue is one of many body parts. We know we have a ton of body parts, right? Head, shoulders, knees, and toes, right? That's just four. There's a lot more. But the one that gets the most airtime in Proverbs isn't the nose, isn't the ears, it's not even the eyes. What is it? The mouth, the tongue. Okay, because it does so much damage. Solomon knew that. King Solomon was wise, and so he addressed it the most. Okay, warning, warning. Next, the tongue is destructive. Not just that it's one of many parts, but destructive. Okay, it boasts of great things, but what can it? But what does it also do? Oh, even though boasting these great things, probably not morally good, but what is vile and harmful? And we know what a little small fire can do. 
right? We live in California. Thankfully, last year, we didn't really have too much smoke, but the years before that, there, were, there was smoke. I will never, ever forget the day when I went outside to move my car on a Wednesday, and I look up in the sky, it's like, this is apocalyptic. The sky is red, right? Because of all the smoke. Like, this is scary. And then my neighbor's out there to also move the car. It's like, yeah, this is scary, okay. And so that's what happens when a fire sets a forest on blaze. Okay, and that was actually due to several forest fires. The tongue is also corrupt. Okay, it's corrupt. It's a world of unrighteousness, as James says in verse 6. Right there, a world of unrighteousness. Unrighteousness is not a good characteristic. It's a bad characteristic. It stains, that's what it says. Stains the whole body. Like coffee on a shirt, right? Like a pen. Have you guys seen it back, back in the old days where like you'd see guys with a pen in their pocket and then it would bleed into their shirt, right? You can't get that out. You gotta either dye that whole shirt that pen color or you throw it away, right? Nobody wants to walk around with a stain on their shirt like that. That's what James is saying, it stains, okay? That which was nice and healthy and whole is now contaminated. Matthew 15, 11 says, a man is not defiled by what enters his mouth, but by what comes out of it. John Calvin, the reformer, he writes, a slender portion of flesh contains in it the whole world of iniquity. Okay? Iniquity, sin, that which is not righteous. Okay? The tongue is corrupt. Okay? Not only is the, not only is the tongue a part of the body, but the tongue also affects one whole, one's whole body. Okay? Again, like a forest fire, it, could, it causes the individual to be stained and affected. Okay, Jesus says this, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, will be subject to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, same word actually, will be subject to the fire of hell. Okay, Don't, it, because that happens, the tongue. We, can, we are so easy to say someone is foolish, is bad, is wrong. The tongue is very interesting. Because think about it. We need to work out other parts of our body, right? When we go to the gym, is there a tongue machine? No. <laughs> you have machines for every part of your body. The, the tongue is a muscle, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you have, right, you have dumbbells, you can do all these different things, you have bench press, weights, all, all the different machines. But the tongue does not need any weight training. The tongue will get its exercise without fail, okay? Like a flint on a lighter, the tongue shoots out sparks, right? It goes in every direction. We can say something crude to a friend. We can cut a loved one. We can give a lashing to an employee or a coworker. We can destroy a career with just a few careless words. But the tongue, see, the tongue, it's always working out, always pumping iron. No weight is too heavy for our tongue. Rather than no pain, no gain, the tongue inflicts pain without strain. Think of it that way, okay? That's what the tongue can do, all right? You never, you never go, oh, my tongue is injured, okay? Well, maybe, but not quite often, okay? so. The tongue, okay, that's what the tongue does. And James says that one's entire course of life is affected by the tongue. Okay, the entire course. And what is the source of the unrighteousness? Like a cigarette bud in a dry forest that sets it on fire by hell? It's hell. That's what's doing it. Subject to, or the, uh, back, uh, go back. It's set on fire by hell at the very end. Okay? That's not of God, right? It's of hell, it's of Satan, it's of the devil. That's our tongue. All 0.014 pounds of it. The tongue is wild. In verses 7 and 8, James says, For every kind of beast and bird, a reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of healing <laughs> poison. <laughs> Deadly. Okay, it's killed. It's poison. All right, poison hurts. It is true what, 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 what James says. Pretty much every animal that has a brain, okay, can be taught by humankind. We've seen the vines in the short videos, right? 
They can shoot threes. Animals, birds can sing. Even other animals can sing. So some people have, you know, their dog can surf or skydive. I'm like, I don't even know how to surf, but this dog can surf. Like, we can train animals to do whatever we want them to do, but the tongue cannot be tamed. It is like a wild animal. You think you've domesticated it? Boom, it bites you. Like a small poisonous dart frog, or even the monarch butterfly is poisonous, okay? And you think about it, little dart frog, sometimes, I mean, some is like that small. But if a predator comes and eats it, oh, it's dead, right? Just a little tiny frog, that big, okay? That's what our tongue is like. But the tongue isn't poisoning like the dart frog for survival. It's doing what? It's a restless evil, okay? It's like a snake, fidgety, agitated, because maybe you stepped on it, but like a silent cobra hiding off of okay? It strikes with deadly accuracy and venom. We can't tame our tongues. It's not controllable, and we can't presume that we can't control it. Because the tongue is actually a reflection of our human, fleshly, sinful bodies and therefore hearts. And if our heart is not aligned with the Father's will, then it will, then it will simply, uh, the words that come out of it will simply be from the flesh. Not good, but evil. Even Jesus chastised the Pharisees. He's, he, he uses what? Vipers, like a snake. He said, you brood of vipers. How can you speak good when you're evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It comes out. Again, it's not what's going in. It's what's coming out. For they did not, they did not speak in defense of God but against God. So we should not become prideful ourselves, or we will sound and appear like Pharisees. Paul also wrote the Roman church in the same way. He says, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we already, well, for we have already charged that, charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as it is written. No one is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Not even all of us. Their throat is an open grave. Okay? They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Ooh, sounds good, right? Sounds like righteousness. Is that what Paul is also saying? No, this is like, we don't want to hear. Already you hear it and you're like, you're cringing in your seats, right? <laughs> but let's reflect on what James is telling us. He's saying this is actually what happens in our mouths due to our hearts. So I want to ask you, take a, let's take a breather. Consider our actions, your actions. Is there anything that you might have said in the past that the Holy Spirit is right now putting on your heart to address. Like, oh, as I'm hearing this, there is something that I said to someone. Write that person's name down. Okay? It may have been just this past week. It may have been years ago. And all of a sudden, boom, oh, I did that. I'm guilty of it. Okay? Is there someone that maybe you need to go and see and ask forgiveness of? Okay? That's what the sermon is also supposed to do. Not just to convict, but help to bring about good, okay? Here's my third point. When we speak our mind, faith works when we know the source of the product. The source of the product. As believers, we are divided in a sense, okay? We're divided people because we are made holy in Christ Jesus and yet we are still in the flesh. And so we continue to have that battle that rages in us. That's what, okay, that's what Paul says, right? He, said, he told the Roman church in chapter 7, 14 to 15, says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. We don't know what Paul did. Okay? He, he, he's vague about it. Maybe for the better, so that we understand that it doesn't matter if it's just a single thing. Maybe, maybe Paul was saying he had a mouth where he, he, he was saying negative things about people. Or maybe it was his thoughts. Okay? Or maybe it was his inaction. We don't know. It doesn't matter because in the end, if it is not of God, okay, it's what God hates. And so he was acting against what God chose to do. Then he tells us, then, okay, let's jump back to James. Now he says, James says this. 
because he's describing how how odd it is that we can do these two diametrically opposed actions with our tongue. It says, with it, our tongue, we bless our Lord and Father. We say, oh, God is great and wonderful, right? Amen, right? And then with the same tongue, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Mm-hmm. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. And he says, my brothers, these things ought not to be so. Because it's, it's, it's like kind of like, you go up to somebody, oh, how are you doing? And then basically you look at it like they're twin, and you say, oh, you suck, right? Like that's what he's saying people are doing. But like, that doesn't make any sense. If you're going to bless God, and yet you're also looking at people who are made in the image of God, how can you say these uh, or much worse things, right? I'm just keeping it PG. Okay, so, but that has happened before, right? You've heard people use cuss words and cuss out somebody and, and, and yell at them, right? That's, okay, but maybe they're not Christians. But the thing is, Paul is saying, hmm, Remember, when these letters, when, when any person writes a letter and we have it in the, in the Bible, the person is addressing an issue. The apostle is saying, I'm seeing this stuff happening. Which means he's saying, hey, church, I'm seeing you guys bless God and then use your tongue to attack somebody. And this should not be happening. I don't think you guys are ready to be teachers in the church. So, is, so these things, James is saying, should not happen, okay? Not what we should do, not what God intends for us to do. And it all is due because we have divided hearts, okay? And everyone did not know it, and, and even today, not everyone knows it in the church. Even in today's age, a friend of mine, he actually told me how in his, well, so I'm giving the background not to call out Koreans, Okay, but Koreans have a different background from Chinese. Right? We're more Buddhist, they're more um, um, shamanistic. Okay, and so that's part of their older religion. And so he actually found out that in his church, one church family was calling curses on another church family. I'm like, what? That happened? Because I can't imagine that happening in a Chinese church. Maybe they did, but I don't know. I haven't heard. Okay, but at least in his church, oh yeah, because of like the culture background, like, oh, okay. And so he had to go in. So what did he do? He said, oh yeah, it's okay. You know, curse the other family, right? Is that, does that make sense? Yes or no? Yes? No? Okay. Oh, I mean, no? I mean, yes? I, okay, anyways. No, we should not be cursing anyone. But this is not even a, a, a cuss word. It's like, oh, I, I, I pray God that you harm this family, that they all die or something. That's what they were doing. And so my friend had to come in and say, oh, no, we are Christians, we don't curse, we bless, okay? Mm -hmm. That is what we are to be doing. So obviously, I don't think my friend would be like, okay, you guys are ready to be teachers in the church, right? No, okay, because they didn't even know you're not supposed to do that, all right? Christians are to bless. We are even to bless our enemies. Jesus tells us, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's what you've heard. That's what the world says. But Jesus says this, I, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who what? Who give you, who treat you to dinners, who, who give you gifts. <laughs> what does persecute mean? Who chase after you, who harm you, who try to throw you in prison, okay? Who do all these negative things. You are to love them and pray for them so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors who are considered sinners do the same. Knowing is half the battle, and James is exposing this dilemma, because there are many a time when we do not even notice our hurtful tongue in action. But when the injury caused by our tongue is revealed to us as Christians, or even as human beings, we should not be happy with the situation we are in. There needs to be recognition that something is fundamentally wrong, okay? And then there should be some sort of resolution. We should not be happy in that situation. Then James turns to the natural world, okay? And he says, just using natural as an example, he says this. Does a spring pour out 
four, sorry, pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water. Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. I'm drinking water, okay? This is not salt water, okay? All right? We don't drink salt water. Maybe we drink soup that has a little salt in it, but we're not going to go to the ocean and start taking big gulps of it, right? That's what he's saying, right? We, the, you can't get from one source both of them, both fresh water and salt water, okay? And I'm teaching middle school earth science. Again, you cannot get salt water from a pure water source, okay? It doesn't work that way. And then he says, a fig tree is not going to bear olives naturally. Yes, of course, you can graft. Of, um, an olive branch onto a fig tree. But naturally, fig trees produce figs, okay? Olives produce olives, whatever the tree is. Naturally, that's all you're going to get. Okay? And in this case, naturally is good. But in the spiritual realm, okay, then God is saying that what we want is that of the supernatural, which is of God, okay? That's coming from above. Now, does it make a little more sense about why James is addressing teachers, okay? Because he's saying that this is how we are to um, act, okay? And so he, as a teacher, he's teaching us as students, so then we can also be good teachers one day. And so your readiness to be a teacher is dependent on your conduct and your works. Here's my last point. When we speak our mind, faith works when the wisdom is from above. And we're going to see why it's from above, why it's so important for it to be from above. Okay, because the next six verses, he's pointing out where the source is that produces our actions, okay, the origins of our actions. So he says this, so it's really small font, don't worry about it, I'm going to help you see it a little bit better. But what I wanted to show you is the top and the bottom are all in black. The one in the middle, the paragraph in the middle is in red, okay, so the black, good. Red, bad. Simple enough? Okay, and we're going to get to the red one. Okay, so let's get to the red one first. Okay, and it says this. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and self selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Every vile practice. So faith is not working if there is bitter jealousy, if there is selfish ambition coming from where? Our hearts, and then therefore coming from our mouths. And where? what is the source of this? Is it coming from heaven? Earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Wisdom from the earth, wisdom from um, from unspiritual, wisdom from the demonic. Demonic. What does demonic mean? It comes from demons. Demons. Okay, pretty simple. That any elementary school kid can answer, right? It's coming from Satan, from the devil. Do not do this wisdom, is what James is telling us. Do not apply this demonic wisdom, especially in the church, but even outside the church. Okay, it's not from God, it comes from our flesh. Okay? And so, and uh, this is where he's saying, yeah, people who do this should not be teachers in the church. And where there's jealousy and selfish ambition, they will produce certain types of fruits which are not good fruits. They are disorder and every vile practice. And James doesn't list it out. Okay? But other places, they do get listed out. Okay? But guess what? Think about it this way. Are vile practices going to put out fires or cause fires? They're going to start fires. They're going to cause fires. They're going to cause an entire forest to get burned down. So let's jump back now. Here's what James says we should do. Okay? And what is wise? He says, who is wise and understanding among you? Verse 13. Okay? But by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But the wisdom from above, now this is coming from God, from heaven, is, fear, is first what? Pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy, good fruits, impartial, and sincere. There's eight of them. 
Okay? These eight are coming from above. It gives us this list. Okay? And I, put, I did it this way. Pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy, good fruits, impartial, and sincere. As I read this, it reminds me of Paul's fruit of the Spirit, right? I think as I read this list, you probably came to that idea too, which is Galatians 5, 2, 22 to 23. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, or forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And then, actually, we know that one. We probably have all memorized it. But here's what Paul goes on to say to the church in Galatia. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit, meaning our tongue, okay, if we're controlling our tongue and therefore our body, we are then doing what is good, right? Not causing fires. But the opposite, that which causes fires is verse 26. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Those are not good. Paul's instruction is to live by the Spirit, to keep in step by the Spirit. And James is doing the same. Okay? Teachers are supposed to be this. You list it again. Pure. What's the opposite of pure? We already discussed stained. We, don't, we should not be stained by the world, not corrupted. Peaceable. That's what we should be. Not hostile or even insistent. We should be gentle. Not, con not unkind or callous. Open to reason versus irrational or difficult. Full of mercy. Not, again, unkind or mean. Good fruits <laughs> versus bad fruits. Jealousy, selfish ambition, and more. Impartial. We know this word already, right? The opposite would be, well, impartial or biased. Sincere. Not dishonest or two-faced or devious. Okay, that's what that would be the opposite. In other words, it's not what the person necessarily knows that determines that they should be a teacher in the church, but it's even more importantly, who they know or whom they know. If they know Jesus, they follow Jesus, and they embody, that means that they ought to be embodying this fruit of wisdom. We'll see it in their good conduct and in their works and in their words. Okay, we'll hear it and we'll see how they handle life by how they describe how they handle life. This is a person who, when they speak their mind, they're not really speaking their own mind. Whose mind are they speaking? That which is coming from above. God's mind, because they are in tune with God. This is the person who should be a teacher because he or she has meekness of wisdom and understanding. Let me end with this. Romans 8, 6 says, For to set the mind on the flesh is death. I know, the topic of death again. Okay. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. And this goes hand in hand with our last verse from chapter 3, which says, And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Okay? At first, when I read that, I'm like, well, what, what are you doing? When you suddenly, after, after that giant list, now you talk about this? Yes, because now he is saying there is a product from the fruit of wisdom, basically. It is a harvest of righteousness. What is a harvest? We don't do this anymore in today's age, right? We don't go out to the fields and, and, and collect the harvest. Okay, we have perpetual fruit all year round, right? But there are times if you have, like, blueberries. What's the season of blueberries? End of summer. Okay, mm -hmm. August and September is when you're supposed to have blueberries. But because we have farms now, we can have blueberries all year round. Or even crab season, right? You can get crab all year round, but when's the best time to get it? Well, when it's cheap, yes. But right now is the time to get crabs, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are seasons when you harvest. Right, right now it's really cheap. Okay, four fifty-five dollars a pound. My wife wants to buy some more tonight. But anyway, mm -hmm. a harvest not of crabs, but of righteousness, is what you get when you have wisdom. Okay, the fruit of, when you have the fruit of the wisdom, fruit of wisdom. So it comes from God. Okay, you have this wisdom and you apply it. Okay, that's good. And then you get even more from that harvest. 
a giant harvest. And here's some other words that are synonymous with righteousness. It's a giant harvest of integrity, of virtue. That's what James is addressing. Are we virtuous people? Because you know what isn't going to result from a harvest of righteousness? A giant destructive fire. Okay? The harvest is due to people who are sowing in peace because they are making peace. Right? Like Smokey the Bear says. I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember what he said. What did he say? You guys know? I should have put the picture up. Only you can prevent forest mm. fires. Right? That's what he said. Right? That's what we should be doing as a church. Not creating fires with our tongue. We should be putting them out. Okay? Basically, if I were to rename this another, this would be like Christians are to be firemen. Okay? And fire women. Okay? We put them out. We see a fire, right? We run to the fire. We get into, we, we slide down the pole, jump in the fire truck. We put it out, right? Like even, even Kyle, last night, we saw two fire trucks drive by us in the opposite dire direction, right? They're going to the, there's a fire somewhere. They're going to go to it. They're like, well, so... Hey, hopefully you have a hose. Like, no, we, you, you, that's what the, the teacher is going to go and help in the church, just as the fireman is going to go to the fire to help put it out. Okay, those are the people who should be teachers. Those are the ones who have wisdom and understanding. Okay, so here are our action items. The first is this: discern the embodying of the fruit of wisdom in your life. Pray about it. Ask the Lord. Take some time and reflect on yourself. And ask people around you in the church who are believers, okay, am I doing, am I embodying Jesus in the way I speak? Which actually reflects the way I think and what's in my heart. Don't be afraid, okay, to be a teacher in the church because it says you'll be judged with greater strictness. Yes, you will. That is a good thing. Okay? It's a challenge to aim for because, that, because we have greater understanding of God's word. James was addressing the people who did not have understanding and wanted to be teachers, and he's like, pull, it, pull those reins back, hold on a second, I don't think you're ready for it, okay? But let us aim for it, let us strive for it, because we are what? We are, we are not poor slaves who can't read. We are literate people. We, we have the Bible, we have every translation that we can read on our phones, right? You go to you version, whatever's translation you want. You can find it. You can use it. Let's do that. Ask Jesus, okay, and ask others, are you embodying the fruit of wisdom, or is that an area you need to work on? The second is this. Seek restoration in a broken relationship. I asked earlier if you have offended or hurt anyone with your words. But now here's the action step, because now you're first you're thinking, yeah, I might have done this to somebody. Okay, but the action step is be that firefighter. Go to the person and see how you can restore the relationship. Okay, put out the fire. Because the bridge between you and that person is on fire, but sometimes they're like, oh, it's on fire, but it's okay. No, put it out. See how the relationship can be restored. Rebuild that bridge. If you know of someone right now, go immediately, in fact. That's what the passage said, right? If you have a problem with your brother and sister, Go, go and take care of it. This is what is right. That's what good conduct looks like. This is what a teacher in the church looks like when they find out, oh, I offended somebody. One who's seeking peace, gentleness, one who's open to reason and sincere. My third is this. Let us pray for wisdom and discernment for our church. Let's pray for that. If we want a harvest of righteousness in our church, we've got to have sound teachers, right? And if we want to have sound teachers, and we want to have more, so our church can be even more healthy, because there are those who are saying, we got, we, I want to be a teacher, but I want to be sound in wisdom and understanding, then we got to be encouraging one another and praying for it so that God will do this. Pray for one another in the church to personify Jesus and have the fruit of wisdom. To be full of mercy, good fruits, impartial. Jesus died for us not to continue to cause fires and destruction in our lives and in the church, but to be a source of comfort and love for those around us. That's why he, what he came to do, right? He didn't come just to die on the cross and say, hey, this is the example. He died for us. 
And if we follow Jesus, that means we imitate him. That means we are going, that we are also, to be, in a sense, imitating him. Sometimes even having to bear the cross for exactly the sins that we deal with. Even our deepest I'm not saying we're working our way into heaven, but I'm saying imitate Jesus. There are times um, where we need to go and we need to run into that fire. So, if you say we follow Jesus, we've got to watch our tongues. Ask the Holy Spirit. Control our tongues. Okay, he is the one because it comes from heaven. Bridle our tongues, and, and that will bridle our body. This is what it means to live with purpose and the purpose God made for us. You guys remember why God made us? To worship him. Okay, and the way to do that is by faith and works. Not with tongues that cause fire, but tongues that, re that, that restore and bring peace. Make sense? Amen? Let's pray.